This morning we are on a late model JK with an LT1. So this is a crate LT1 right from GM versus the last Jeep I did which had an L86 in it. And I can tell you, I can't tell any difference. When we take the L86 and we put the LT1 intake on it and it looks just like an LT1, it acts just like an LT1, it drives just like an LT1. Both are awesome combinations. So in my opinion, if you have the opportunity to get the L86 LT1, get it because it's going to save you a couple thousand dollars and there is no downside. This video is going to be about the difference between the LTs because a lot of guys still refer to the LTs as LSs and really don't understand the different LT engines. So let's start with this combination, the LT1 and the L86. So let me start by saying some of the differences between the LT1 and the L86. Essentially they're the same engine. The intake is different. The LT1 runs a vacuum port in the intake and the L86 runs a vacuum pump on the driver lower for your vacuum brakes. I personally like the vacuum pump because as long as the engine's turning, you got full vacuum. For the most part, you're not going to notice any difference. They both supply enough vacuum. The LT1 runs a different oil pan with a oil cooler built into the pan where the truck ports the oil out to a separate cooler. So the truck essentially can have a heavy duty or oil cooler. But that's not to say you can't block off the oil cooler on the side of the LT1 pan, you can, because that's what we do. Otherwise, it would hit the differential, and then we port it out to an external cooler. Of course, the accessory drives are different. We like running the, the truck accessory drive. It seems to be more readily available and less costly. So let's go back to the beginning. What is the LT? Well, the LT is the next generation. It's generation five. Remember, generation one and two were small block Chevys. In the 80s, I think it was, maybe the early 90s, they changed up the small block a bit, changed the head design and the splayed bolts and stuff, but we're not gonna talk about that. Then, of course, the Gen 3 LS came out, and that was a revolution, because now we went from a really a, an old, 50-year-old design, cast iron. The cylinder head technology was very primitive, to a modern, all-aluminum, skirted block, six-bolt main, higher compression. The little 5.3 LS is putting out over 300 horsepower and that's not quite far off from being double the horsepower of the early 5.7 K motors especially the smog motors they were rated at like 190 horsepower we did put a lot of gen 3s in the early Chevy trucks to replace the small blocks the guys were always happy with the power and they always bragged about how much better economy they were getting so the gen 3 engine really was a step up the gen 4 engine took the Gen 3 engine to the next level. They added variable valve timing, they added a six-speed transmission, which I think is huge, and just overall updated the design. The engine became simpler, especially for emissions. For the most part, EGR valves and secondary air systems were gone. So GM had choices, and they experimented with a lot of different designs. They experimented with a dual VVT cam, a cam inside cam. Of course, they have the four valve engines, like the LT5 and, and the Mercury Marine engine. But what they settled on was a good old overhead valve V8 that added the technology that the Europeans and others had been running for years. So first they bumped the compression up. On this engine I'm driving the LT1 to 11 and a half to one compression. That's massive guys. I, I grew up in the muscle car era and 11 to one was a lot to run on pump gas. Now we're running 11 and a half to one on pump gas. But that compression ratio and the cubic inches of this engine determines its potential energy, which is a lot. So the question became, how do we tame that energy? Well, first you have to control combustion chamber pressure. So they do that with VVT, but they stepped it up a notch. They went to continuous variable valve timing, which means the cam can phase anywhere. It's not just on or off, open or closed, parked or open. It can be phased anywhere. And by doing that, now we have precise control of the combustion chamber pressure, which does a lot of things. When we want the horsepower, we can retard the cam to keep spark knock away, but at the same time at light loads, we can advance that cam for best throttle response in fuel economy. And remember, we're also using VVT to lower combustion chamber pressure for NOx or nitrites of oxygen, which is a bad gas, which for the longest time, and Chrysler still does use an EGR valve or a exhaust gas recirculation valve to put inert exhaust gas back into the intake to lower that combustion chamber pressure. Well, we got rid of all that. They made it efficient. They stayed with a tried and true V8 overhead valve American engine, which we know has reliability, longevity, horsepower, 
and then they applied all the technology to it. So let's start off with the LED3 and the LED6. We're virtually identical engines. One's a 5.3 cubic inch, one's a 6.2 cubic inch. That's what we first started doing back in 2016. Now the first swaps we did were six speeds because the eight speed really wasn't readily available yet and they were having issues with it. So the LT 5.3 and 6.2, L83 and L86 are all aluminum, six bolt cross bolted main. The L83 is about 11 to one compression. The L86 is about 11 and a half to one compression. They run continuous variable valve timing. They run dual stage oil pumps. They run active fuel management, which is a four eight cylinder mode for fuel economy. They run low friction technology like alternators, bearings, uh, even the transmission. Personally, I have an L83 in my JL and I love it. I think the 5.3 LT is the optimal engine for the JK. Now whether it's an L82, an L83, or an L84, it doesn't matter to me. They have plenty of power. They get good fuel economy. They're just awesome, awesome engines. And we're gonna be doing a video on the JL here soon because we're getting so much requests for it. The 6.2, of course, has more horsepower. We're talking 430, 440 horsepower, but that is deceiving. We have run the L86s against 480 horse LS3s and 475 horse Hemis, and they beat them all day long. Why? Because they're putting out massive torque at low RPM. You're putting out somewhere between three and 400 foot-pounds of torque at 2,000 RPM with an LT 6.2. The other engines have to wait till they get up into the RPM band, and it's the traditional pyramid style torque and horsepower curve where the LTs flatten that curve out and you get a lot more torque. So what we notice is the LTs will outrun those other engines on the bottom end. We all know the 6L80 is a good transmission and we ran it in the early LTs, but when the 8-speed came out, of course, we had to jump on that bandwagon. Early 8-speeds, 14, 15, 16, had issues. They had long adaptive learn time. They had programming issues. GM constantly updated them. And in a few cases, they actually had hardware issues. And I might want to add the early LTs, like 14, 15, also had some hardware updates related to AFM, bending push rods and lifters and things. So by 17, they had it sorted out. That's why you want to go with a 17 or newer powertrain. Same thing with the 8L90. We noticed by 17, they had most of the bugs out. But that's not to say the early 8L90s couldn't run good. They can run fabulous, but you just got to drive the heck out of them before they do. I got lucky in my JL, it didn't take long, but that's one of the best shifting transmissions in any swap we've ever done, and that's a 2015 8-speed. It did take a little time to learn, but once it did, they are viable transmissions, but you might as well just get yourself a, a Gen 1 or 2 10-speed. And I say Gen 1 or 2 because GM did change the 10-speed in about 2019-20 and went to a Type 2 with some improvements. I don't notice a whole lot of difference between like the 19 type one and then the the 20 type two so the moral of that story is try to stay away from the early eight speeds and the early lts if possible now something funny happened with the 5.3 i don't know if gm ran out of parts or what i got a feeling that might be what it is but after the led3 the led2 came out it's a 5.3 and there's a lot of conflicting information on this engine if you go to gm authority and other sites they will tell you that this engine is identical to the L83 except for the accessory drive. It has AFM and all this other stuff. But we actually purchased L82s and I can tell you that's not the case. Here's what we find. The L82 does not have AFM or active fuel management. It's kind of like the L9H versus the L94. So you don't have the AFM lifters. You don't have that lifter manifold assembly and all the electronics that go along with it. So some of you guys may prefer the L82 because most of you don't run the AFM anyway so why not eliminate all that hardware? And that probably means that this engine can spin up a little bit higher. And I have seen L82s rated up to 380 horsepower. Think about that. That's more than a 5.7 Hemi in this little 5.3. That's pretty impressive. So not having the AFM, it appears GM has eliminated the dual stage oil pump. Henceforth, more complexity. However, I do like that dual stage oil pump, I think it could be beneficial. But the bottom line is, early on GM realized that oil pressure was really important to AFM and DFM. DFM is dynamic fuel management. In the early Gen 4 LSs, they were crunching lifters by overpressurizing the components in the AFM system, so they added additional regulators, one inside of the oil pan, to bleed that pressure off and keep the lifters happy. So that brings us up to the LT1, and the LT1 is top of the pile as we all know yeah there's the lt45 and all that stuff but we're just talking about the everyday engines that shops put in 
The LT1 was designed for performance in a Camaro or a Corvette. The LT1 has 11 and a half to one compression. It has a high capacity oil pan with a built-in oil cooler as we discussed. The earlier LT1s had a different cam phaser than the late ones. We noticed no difference. I think they changed the cam phasers about a year ago for better compatibility with the other engines in production like the L87 and L84. But in any event, it is basically an L86 with a low rise intake, looks really cool. Is there a difference in the cam and the programming and all that? Yeah, probably a little bit, but the changes are really minimal. I drive them both and I would be happy with either one. The LT1 is rated at 460 horsepower in most production vehicles. And I can tell you that they will outrun the 500 horsepower vehicles from my experience because again, that bottom end torque, bringing that horsepower in at low RPM means that you can gain that advantage. If, now, if you got a 600 horsepower LS3, that LS3 is gonna come alive and eventually outperform that LT. But for most purposes and for most situations, the LTs are just amazing with their bottom end torque, especially in heavy JKs like the one I'm in. That's gonna move us into the next generation of the LT, which I'm gonna call the L84 and the L87. The L84 and the L87 are essentially the new version of the L83 and the L86. They ditched AFM, active fuel management, which is a four to eight cylinder mode, and they added dynamic fuel management, which is a two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight cylinder mode. So essentially, the engine can run as, as pretty much any cylinder count that they want. And yeah, that, that's obviously gonna give you a little bit more uh, economy, and more importantly, it's gonna give you um, better drivability in my opinion, because just going from a four to an eight, even though they staged the cylinders, you only had four cylinders you could deal with. Now you got all eight cylinders you can deal with. So in order to implement DFM the way GM wanted to, they took the lifter manifold assembly, which is where the solenoids were housed for the earlier LSs, and they moved the solenoids directly into the block. So there was a block redesign and that means there's not a whole lot of compatibility between the later LT and the earlier LT, at least the LED3 and the LED6. We did an L87 and we are gonna be doing L84s and L87s in the future. I think they're awesome. One of the issues we had was supporting the late model transmissions and I can happily say that we are doing that now. We can now run the Type 2 10 speeds and support the L84 and the L87. The cost of programming these has now gone down now it's not cheap it's not as cheap as an ls but it's come way down so you're going to be seeing those l84s and l87s go drive an l84 5.3 in a rental truck you'll be amazed how much power that thing has that thing will outrun a hemi 5.7 pretty much with ease same thing with a six liter ls and the whole time getting 20 miles to the gallon in that little truck it's an amazing engine and we're going to be supporting it the LD4 and the LD7 also introduced stop start, which you guys know what that is. A lot of you don't like it. A lot of you, actually, I'm going to say most of you don't like it. I don't personally like it. When the engine dies at a stoplight, that's always kind of a trigger for me, and I don't like them. I don't think it gains you enough economy, unless if you're in traffic where you're going to be sitting you know, on a freeway for 10, 20 minutes at a time, maybe. But other than that, I prefer not to have stop start. Now, moving on from there, of course, there's other LT engines, the GM Performance LT engines. At one time, they had a carbureted 500 horsepower, 6.2 LT. They've got, of course, the LT4, the LT5. LT5 is really interesting. It's not just an LT1 with a blower. It's got a second set of injectors. It's got 16 injectors, so that engine can put out near 1,000 horsepower. It's, it's a pretty awesome engine, but that's not really where we want to go with this video. So I want to finish up by talking about the transmissions a second. The Chrysler 4-speed sucked, and that's all there is to it. If the 3.8 had a better transmission, it would have done much better in the JK. The WA580 was definitely an improvement from the 4-speed, but nothing like the modern high gear transmissions. The new Chrysler 8-speed is much, much better. I had one in my JL, and that with the Penstar really woke it up. Uh, once you go to 40s with that combination, while it can still pull 7580, it's just not as comfortable as a V8, especially if you have a high drag heavy JK. If you look at some of these SUVs that GM is cranking out, like the Denali's and the Escalades, these things are massively heavy, and guys load them down and they put trailers on them. So you all know about the 8-speed had a rough start, the 8090. It is a strong transmission, good for, I believe, about 700 foot-pounds of torque, maybe more. GM sorted it by about 17, in my opinion. They had issues with the fluid viscosity, so there's this blue fluid now that they flush these out with them, and that fixes them most of the time. But the newer 8L90s, they just seem to run great. 
Uh, the only difference between that and the 10-speed is the 10-speed has two more gears, a little bit more diversity in gearing, and with a heavy JK and larger tires, that may be an advantage. You are going to feel a little bit more shifting, which annoys some guys, but the shifting is so not dramatic. It's like you barely even notice the thing shifts at all. So then we move into the early 10-speed, which came out in about 18, and I love those transmissions. I think they're great. We didn't really have a lot of problems with those. Uh, they do have a slight amount of learning to do, but not too much to talk about. So the early 10 speeds, in my opinion, are a winner. And then they went to the Type 2 10 speed, which is awesome. It's great. The problem with the Type 2 10 speed was the modules. GM encrypted the TCM. Put it all together, and I don't think you can beat these LTs. GM is, is continuing to support them. I don't think they're going to end of life them soon, like Chrysler is talking about doing with the Hemi. In my opinion, you get the best of all worlds. Drivability, economy, power. I hope that answers some of the questions about the LT engine. So uh, we're going to hit the mountain and we will see you shortly.